My name is Gaither Stevens, and I am uh, thrilled to be here, uh, by the way. Uh, just to let you know, I have cards up on the table over there next to that speaker. And uh, feel free to grab one whenever. Uh, I'll be uh, leaving them up there. Oh, no, apparently i got to keep touching this thing because it might go to sleep on me. So, no big deal. I, I know the password. I've got the power. <laughs> so, I want to start off by just thanking you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I know a lot of you here, and the ones I don't know, I'd like to get a chance to. Um, hopefully through the course of the presentation or, or afterwards. Um, I can be very anxious and nervous and pretend not to be. So if I seem like I'm like ignoring you, it's just because I'm probably very anxious. <laughs> and, um, I know a lot of people can kind of relate to that, but I like to say it out, out up front and out loud because I think it makes other people um, feel a little more at ease with me and they're not like, oh, he's just standoffish. No, I'm just very scared. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but, I, I, but I'm up here and I try and I've been in many NHSDCs and I want to thank right now the NHSDC for having me back. Um, it's an incredible organization. It's an incredible conference. Uh, if it's the only conference you go to in a year, you're probably doing okay. Um, honestly, I've, I've got a lot of chances to go to different conferences. I've been to several of them. The one I always come back to is the NHSDC. Um, it just really, for me, it's the meat, it's, it's the people, um, it's, it's the, like where the rubber meets the road, even kind of in, in an unseen way, and so it's, I really appreciate it. So thank you for the NHSDC and for everybody here that's um, at the conference. Uh, like I kind of said before, I know that we've all got tasks looming, so like if I make eye contact and you're reading an email or checking your laptop, I'm not judging you. I'm just trying to like do the thing where you look around the crowd and you know, make eye contact. I was in the crowd before and I, I had emails and users and, and CEOs and all kinds of people bugging me. So if you need to work, work. I'm not, I'm not holding it against you. Um, in fact, I'll just kind of uh, cheat and tell you that most of the stuff's in the slides. In fact, a lot of the stuff I talk about will be. I put notes to help me out. So if you miss something, just grab the slide deck. You'll be fine. Oh, one thing I would like to mention um, before we get too started. Uh, has anyone here ever heard of the COC Alliance? Anybody? A couple people, a couple people, okay. It's about 1,300 people um, in a Slack group. I mean, not all the time, but it's, you know, we've had that many people sign up for it. And it's uh, HMIS admins, COC leadership. Uh, it's www.cocalliance.org. It's a Slack group and it's free and you can just join it and then just ask questions, answer questions about people like us. So it's almost a way of kind of continuing the NHSDC kind of uh, mentality and attitude um, throughout uh, the rest of the year. It's there all the time. So feel free to join it and uh, check it out. Okay, so we're gonna be coming, uh, covering a lot of stuff today, honestly. Um, the main thing is I just wanna be able to show you some of the things that I've learned um, through the course of social services and realizing how much you know I needed help. So we're gonna go through a little bit of my life. We're gonna talk about social services. We're gonna talk a little bit about AI, uh, more specifically about AI chatbots and assistance. And then we're gonna talk about how those can actually help, um, help uh, social services. And honestly, just about anybody really today. And then we're gonna offer some, um, some advanced AI uh, tips and tricks um, in the future. And then we'll take questions at the end. And we might even do a little bit of a workshop depending on the timing. We'll see, I'll, we'll, we'll see what we get to. Cause I'm hoping to get a lot of questions. So <clears throat> I'm gonna take a few moments during this next section to introduce myself and to tell you a little bit about my journey through life and how that journey led me here. Albert Einstein once said, once we accept our limits, we go beyond them. Understanding our limitations doesn't mean we're settling for them or using them as excuses. Rather, it provides a clear starting point for growth. By acknowledging what holds us back, we can devise specific strategies to go beyond those barriers. Limits are not the end, they're merely waypoints on the journey to improvement. Many suspect that Einstein may have had uh, high functioning autism actually, uh, and he was still able to accomplish many, many great things and live a great, wonderful life. We're gonna revisit this in a moment if you wonder why I might have mentioned it, that, that uh, Einstein may have had autism. So, sorry if this slide catches anyone off guard, but. I actually have um, ADHD and autism. Um, but it's more than just a simple footnote in my biography. It's actually pivotal for grasping. Did I lose my audio? Is that slow? Test, test. Yeah, we had to turn it down a little bit. Oh, sorry, sorry. No. <laughs> I, I have a booming voice. Yes, I actually have an asynchronous voice. We'll get to this in a few minutes, but I was in radio for 20 years. I could go without a microphone if I need to. 
it's possible. If everyone can hear, okay. Yeah. yeah, if you can't hear me, just, you know, wave. All right. So going back to autism and my inability sometimes to know social uh, context and know how loud I am. Um, personal, actual lesson right in front of you. So it helps me to navigate my life. And there are other people that have had similar situations. Um, Temple Grandin, um, Sir Anthony Hopkins, and as I mentioned before, Einstein was also suspected of being neurodiverse. But it exemplifies how unique cognitive structures can drive exceptional accomplishments. I'm only recently diagnosed, but I've reframed these traits as the backbone to uh, support my specialized abilities by operating um, not at what, I guess, society would call a normal baseline, because that's what I, I strive for a bit, at, at first, I think. I just wanted to be normal. And then once I kind of realized that maybe normal wasn't an option, you know, because I, I have these traits that are part of me, maybe I could actually kind of grasp what I have, be as good as I could at it, and then even excel. And that's what's kind of surprised me, because I feel like in life I've done really well, despite my, my, my dis disabilities, and yet, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see where I'm up here today, whereas five, six, seven, eight years ago, I would be scared and, and kind of stuck with things. Now I'm up here able to do things that I never saw seven or eight years ago. So I just kind of touch on this to encourage everybody else um, and kind of give you an idea that, yeah, I do have some difficulties. And like I said earlier, I, I do get anxious and nervous, but I love talking to people. So feel free to come up and uh, say hi. Kind of going on this, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, because obviously I come up here and I drop some bombs, and there's a lot of baggage sometimes that comes around with neurodiversity. Um, but just to let you know, I did go to Purdue University. Uh, I, I graduated with a 3.28. I went to Indiana Wesleyan University at 3.83, and I went to Boston University with a 3.57 GPA. So I, I try to do you know computer information systems. I, I go with what worked, you know, and, and understanding uh, logic and technology. That was a better, that was a, an easier thing for me sometimes than people. Um, so I went to where I could exceed and then worked on some of the other areas that I knew I needed to still work on. So, in fact, I actually graduated high school with only about a 1.5 GPA, um, but I was still able to succeed. In fact, um, out of high school, I went into radio. I, I actually tried college initially, didn't do so well because I didn't really know some of the challenges that I was facing. I didn't really understand that when I tried to do things the same way other people did, I didn't accomplish things, and that surprised me. So I had to retool things and rethink how my life worked. Um, but I went into radio for about 20 years. I was able to, uh, I made over a million dollars in radio, actually. It was, a, it was a great business. I, I enjoyed it, I had a lot of fun, met a lot of great people. Um, but the point I'd like to make about this is, just because somebody has a disability, or even multiple disabilities, that does not necessarily mean that they are disabled. Um, although I had many challenges that I faced personally, educationally and professionally, I found that by building supports and using tools, I could not only reach nominal performance levels, but even exceed them. So for many years, I successfully managed five radio stations with three offices, with 10 studios across two states, and all never even knowing I had any disabilities at all. So. Next, we're gonna take this into social services. And we're gonna talk about some of the root causes of social service problems and also some of the solutions. So in 2016, I was hired as a data analyst for the Charlotte County Homeless Coalition. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, on a side note, I'm actually, see, I'm on the board now at the Charlotte County Homeless Coalition, kind of coming full circle, and uh, the woman in the front with the red uh, uh, shirt, she's the, actually the only other person at that organization. Uh, since 2016, every other person uh, is no longer there, so high turnover. With, I'm sure you don't know anything about that in social <laughs> services. Right? High turnover, never deal with that. So yeah, we deal with it at, at my organization as well. <clears throat> so, when I got hired in as a data analyst, you know, I, I, I'd managed, uh, like I said, many radio stations. I'd, I'd done lots of projects. I, I, I'd done well in college. You know, I figured a, a data analyst, it would, it would be, you know, kind of a junior level thing I could, I could wade into easily, you know, very easily. And little did I realize that, you know, a, a lot comes with a simple title. Um, you know, as a data analyst, I was, I actually became, eventually, I had all the same uh, uh, responsibilities as the data analyst, as the, I was a chief technology officer later and didn't have like really much more responsibilities. I was just as responsible as a data analyst. 
Um, so I had to wear many hats from CTO to marketing director, IT to training and support, and I led various committees like our veterans committee, our uh, chronic committee. Um, I am not a social worker, so I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, thank uh, God for all the other amazing social workers out there that were able to help me out and case managers. That was fantastic. Uh, but I should not have been leading the, the, those, those meetings, but yet that's probably a lot of situations you guys get in. You're not supposed to be doing it, but who else is going to? So you do it. Um, we had outdated systems. Uh, when I came in, we were using an exchange server from 2007, which was odd because you couldn't get your email outside of the building. So like if you just like went to the parking lot, your phone, no email, you went home, no email. They had like certain people that could get email, but they couldn't reply to the email. So it's really weird, you know, like I could read this email, I could freak out about it, but I can't do anything, this is awesome. So I went in and I, I switched everything over and, and we all, we could get our emails outside of the building. That was a great thing, believe it or not. But there was a lot of other stuff that went along with that. Like all our, all our files were on a local server and I put them in the cloud, things like that, that you know, really helped the organization out. Uh, we had a lot of security issues. So um, in our system, uh, every, in our HMIS, every user was the highest level access. They were sysadmin two. So if you had a, a volunteer account, um, uh, uh, which, you know, at that time, we had 18 different people using one volunteer account in a church, and they were sysadmin two in our system. So any 90-year-old person could have just deleted everything and, oh well. So I had to fix that. I fixed that, by the way. I didn't just leave that. <laughs> it broke a lot of stuff. Don't worry. I broke things by fixing them, but then I fixed those. So, and, it, and it's better. It got a lot better, trust me. Um, incorrect project. So I don't know, depending on your system or whatnot. So our all our projects in our system were level one. So there was no hierarchy whatsoever. Uh, we couldn't run reports. I mean, the system was just it was it was a mess. So I had to come in and fix all that um, as a data analyst. Uh, I didn't do this. Someone else at our organization. Um, but it's all because of the whole point of us not having enough resources, time, and energy, and social services is what I came into. But we actually lost a two hundred thousand um, dollar HUD funding because someone forgot to. Uh, submit the NOFO by like 15 minutes. So I, I think you guys are getting a picture of, of what I came into um, in this organization, when I started this organization. I just thought it's the way it was. I didn't know, you know. I was in radio, it's a lot different. You, know, you come into social services and, you know, I was scared. <laughs> More so than normal. That's a lot. So as we turn our attention to this slide, it's crucial to acknowledge the ongoing challenge of homelessness. Despite the efforts of roughly 350 organizations across the nation, the reality is that as of 2020, the federal funds available were simply not enough to support over 580,000 Americans in need of housing. Uh, this underscores a persistent gap between our aspirations and the resources allocated, and it's only getting worse. I mean, I think that was 2020. I think we've all seen what's going on. I, I work with a lot of communities across the country. What I'm seeing are uh, people experiencing homelessness way up, especially families and multi-adult uh, households, surprisingly. And I'm seeing the housing, you know, going down. But hopefully, as the money comes back, we'll see the trends go back. But right now, you know, it's not been good for a while. It's getting worse. So back in 2012, Mark Johnston, then with HUD, gave a quick guess. This is a guess. This is not any hard concrete number, but it was someone that knew what they were talking about somewhat. He said that it would come. It takes about 20 billion uh, to end homelessness in uh, the United States. And this is just a rough estimate. It's probably a lot more than that. Just, you know, we gotta have at least a ballpark. I mean, I, I think a lot of times, even our communities, you know, we, we, we talk about money and we need money, we need money. But really, a lot of times, we don't know how much money we need. Like, I'm a, I mean, it's almost like the goalpost is so far away that we don't even consider it. It's like, well, what would we do if we solved homelessness? Well, okay, that's impossible. Oh, really? We're just assuming this is an impossible solution. Um, but if, if you have a problem, like if I have a, a problem in my house, I get an estimate. That's like the first thing I do. And yet in homelessness, we don't know how much it's going to cost in our community to fix it or to do what we have to do. It seems odd when you have to go then ask for money because how much money are you asking for? And the problem is if you need $20 billion and you ask for $4 billion, which I'm not saying is what we're asking for, but that's about what we get right now is about $4 billion in the United States. You're going with about a $16 billion deficit, but a lot of communities I work with don't even know what it would take. And so they come in and they just go, oh, we need, we, we need 200,000, but it's just a, a ballpark number. But it's that number for the immediate need. It's that, it's, this is the emergency to cover, you know, next two months, but it's like, what about 10 years? 
So that's just something to kind of think about. And it, it, not to mention, this is a yearly deficit. So what happens when you deal with a deficit? Things just get worse. They don't, they don't stay the same and then you, know, you hope they get better. They actually get worse. If you underfund something, that's kind of how that works. You know, we try not paying your bills for a while and see how well it goes. I mean, I think we know. And yet this is the, the situation that we're currently operating under. So, and we're acting like it's okay. So this is just a little note, and hey, I'm not, I, I don't get into politics whatsoever or what should be spent on anything, but $16 billion deficit every year, we spend $773 billion on the US military budget. That doesn't include VA funding, that's another $300 billion. I think it's over a trillion. And one thing we need to also remember is something like the F-35. Uh, the F-35 program has been kind of embarrassing and had a lot of problems with it, but it only costs $1.5 trillion. So just, I'm pointing out that there's a lot of money out there and it's possible to reallocate some. Now I'm not saying this budget or whatever budget, but I'm just saying if we, first step is know what you need, second step, find where it's at. So in considering the financial commitment to addressing homelessness in the United States, it's illuminating to compare the expenditure in this area to the revenues from industries that are largely, largely discretionary. The threshold for this comparison is set to $4 billion, which is notably surpassed by each of the following industries. I want to highlight a couple of them. So video games, uh, 15 times that $4 billion threshold. Uh, streaming services, and uh, that's music and video, 8 times. Cosmetics, uh, 12 times. Fashion retail, 9 times. And how about candy and chocolate, 9 times. I, I know. So, <laughs> well, you work in social services. You might need that last one quite a bit. So, <laughs> we don't have to take from that one. We can take from streaming. I don't know. Who knows? I, I could look people like that too. Um, yeah, we can continue that trend. I mean, look at alcoholic beverages 63 times greater than the threshold. Coffee shops 11 times. Pet products 25. And luxury goods uh, 21. So these comparisons strikingly highlight that the allocations of funds is a matter of priority. The revenue from just one of these industries could significantly transform the landscape of resources dedicated to homelessness in the U.S. It's clear that as a society, the resources exist. The challenge lies in choosing to direct even a fraction of these funds to address critical social issues. Okay. So what happens when you have a deficit every year. Well, in our efforts to allocate funds across various sectors in our nation, we inadvertently impose restrictions on our capacity to assist those in need, which signals a troubling misalignment of our societal priorities. This is precisely where advocacy plays a crucial role in our profession. The current lack of emphasis on homelessness and social services in the United States leads to a series of significant challenges. We get unequal service allocation, Limited resources often result in unequal distribution of services, disproportionately impacting the most vulnerable populations. Compromised care quality. When resources are stretched, the quality and effectiveness of social services can diminish. Flawed data. Nobody here has ever dealt with that. Insufficient funding can lead to inadequate data collection, yielding unreliable insights that could misinform policy decisions. Something that I know that I've dealt with a lot in organizations I've worked with, staff burnout. Resource scarcity can lead to burnout among workers, reducing productivity and leading to higher turnover rates. Operational waste, so without the right monitoring tools, resource usage can become inefficient, exacerbating the issue of scarcity. Stifled strategic planning, with a focus on immediate concerns due to limited resources, long-term strategic planning, and the flexibility of organizations can suffer. So as we move forward, it's critical to view these issues not as unmanageable obstacles, but as areas where the strategic application of technology and innovation can drive meaningful change. When addressing the issue of resource scarcity and tackling social problems, we come to understand two fundamental truths. Firstly, the resources currently at our disposal are inadequate for solving our problem. That may not be true in every community, I don't know, but 99% of the ones that I have seen, that is a, a truth. It is our responsibility to manage what we have with the utmost care, making sure every asset is utilized to its greatest effect in service of our goals. 
Secondly, while our immediate resources are lacking, there exists a wealth of resources in the wider community that could provide solutions. I'd like to point out too, not just federal, they are local, state, private, there's lots of opportunities, not just HUD. So the challenge then is to advocate for access to these additional resources. To support sustainable growth, we must step into the role of advocates, pushing for an increase in resources, and often this involves strategically using the limited resources we already have to amplify our call for action and to ensure that this call is not just heard, but acted upon. So in summary, our dual approach combines maximizing efficiency with active advocacy, working simultaneously to enhance our use of what we have and to secure what we still need. Water break. <laughs> All right. So time to switch gears. Instead of talking about all the problems we face with social services, I'm going to introduce some possible solutions that will hopefully add new tools to your toolkit. So let's embark on a brief journey through AI's history from the theoretical underpinnings laid by Alan Turing to today's advanced neural networks. We witnessed an astonishing rate of progress. And now we stand on the brink of a new era with AI and our interaction with technology. It's impressive to me how much progress has been made in just the last 10 years alone. Over the next few slides, we'll be diving into the current technologies powering the current AI revolution, including transformers, large language models, and generative pre-trained transformers. So transformers are a type of architecture designed to process sequences of data, like text, by paying attention to the relationships between elements regardless of their existence, existing distance from each other. Um, this makes them excellent for understanding and generating human language. Now, LLMs, or large language models, are built on top of transformer technology, and they are trained on vast amounts of text, enabling them to comprehend and produce language with remarkable nuances. Generative pre-trained transformers, or GPTs, I'm sure as some of you have heard of, they are a subset of LLMs, and they're developed by um, AAI, but there are other chat, uh, AI chatbots out there as well. We'll be talking about different ones, but I'll be using them kind of in a generic sense. So together, these technologies represent a significant leap in AI's ability to interact with and process human language. <laughs> so this is kind of interesting. Um, so in the digital realm of AI, we often talk about transformers but not the kind that you might remember from Saturday morning cartoons. And we're not talking about Optimus Prime here. Um, these are designed to process words in context, reshaping sentences with precision to create text that's remarkably human-like in its understanding and nuance. Now, while I can't showcase the actual Transformers for copyright reasons, um, I was able to use their essence to inspire an AI-generated image. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting, I was like, hey, you know, pulled up a transformer and the AI chatbot was like, yeah, I can't do that. I, I, I can, but you can kind of get around something like that, something like that, just by saying, well, what about a robot that transforms from a car into a blah, 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 you just describe it and it kind of does it for you. I didn't really try to get to, I don't, I'm not trying to do copyright infringement, but it's amazing how it's just like the essence of something, that's okay. So little nuances of, 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 uh, of uh, chatbots can be kind of interesting to learn. So I know this looks um, very complex, but I have a, a great way to kind of explain this. So this is a transformer, and one way to think of a transformer is to imagine a DJ mixing tracks at a party. The DJ doesn't just play songs one after the other, they blend them together, adjusting the mix based on the vibe of the crowd, the energy on the dance floor, and the flow between the songs. Transformer technology and AI works in a somewhat similar fashion but with words and sentences. When we communicate, our sentences are like a music playlist, where each word has its beat, and the overall message depends on how these beats come together. Transformers analyze the entire playlist, the sentence or paragraph, all at once. They use something called attention mechanisms, which is like the DJ skill in figuring out which tracks or words will vibe well together to maintain the energy or meaning of the conversation. This means that when you ask the AI a question or for, or for a story, it doesn't just consider your words in order, but it looks at them all together, understanding how they relate to each other, much like a DJ reads the room to know what song to play next. 
This helps the AI generate responses that are not just relevant, but also coherent and contextually rich, ensuring the conversation keeps flowing smoothly, just like a well-curated music set. Now, if you want to download the slide deck for this, I actually have some more notes in this. I'm not gonna, unless someone's like, I really need to know what a decoder is. I mean, I can tell you, but it's like, it's a little too much of the weeds for right now, but all the information is in the slide deck if you do want them, and it's pretty interesting. Something I would like to show out, and then show, and, and this is, I've actually talked to my wife quite about, a bit about this. In a lot of ways, I relate to some of the AI chatbots because they're not really looking, they're not really, it, it's a lot of word association. It's a lot of like words and space, and so you tell me something, if you brought up a, a, a topic, you know, if you said like, you know, Transformers, I'm like, boom, boom, boom. I start like in my brain kind of thinking of all these things collectively that are similar together, and I can talk to you about that in a group. Now, that may mean that I may be like, oh yeah, there's this, what have you heard about GoBots? You're like, well, we're talking about Transformers. Yeah, but in my mind, GoBots and Transformers are the same. So I kind of get that, but then I go, wait a minute, self-awareness. Were we talking about GoBots? Maybe not, let's go back to Transformers. So as a person, I do that. Um, but you see this right here, this, uh, 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 Feed forward, the multi-head attention. This, this kind of stuff where you see the intention, that's where it's like, it's not just giving you the answer, it's stopping part way between, going, whoa, does this make sense? Whoa, does this make sense? And I do that a lot in my personal life. I'll, I'll say something and I'll be like, whoa, did that make sense? And believe it or not, that, that really helps a lot. Um, because when you're not doing things naturally and like normally, I mean, it's, it's not a, a human being, so it's, it's, it's pretending the best it can be. It's, it's doing this kind of feedback. Am I doing the thing right? Am I, am I wearing this right? Is this tied the way it should be? Am I wearing it behind my back? You know? And I'll be honest, AI does weird stuff like that sometimes. So it, it actually gets kind of funny. Um, I, I probably do too. I just, you know, I'm better at hiding it. <laughs> so there are six uh, main types of transformative uh, AI technologies that are, are out right now. Um, so, and we can kind of explore it. We'll kind of go through some of them. L large language models are really what we're gonna be talking about. And they excel at understanding and generating human language. Uh, machine learning platforms are the toolkits of crafting AI models, while robotic process automation, or RPA, streamlines our repetitive tasks. Uh, computer vision grants machines the gift of sight to interpret our world, and natural language processing, or NLP, bridges human uh, AI communication gaps. And then lastly, neural networks and deep learning are the engines of pattern recognition uh, driving forward uh, innovation. Each type of AI has tr transformative potential, ready to be unlocked across various fields and facets of life. All of these technologies use transformers, but we're only going to focus on one particular transformer for the rest of this presentation, and those are LLMs. So a lot of times, I'm kind of noticing this, the more I learn, I'm finding that people talk about AI as if it's one comprehensive thing, but it's really not. Each company has their own version. The AI chatbots are really different from the uh, image, genera image generation software. Like, it, it, it's almost like, I guess, the outputs are where it kind of gets separated out more, and that's gonna be, kind of explained in this slide. So where the large language models will start with structured data, text, voice and audio, 3D signals, and images, they will pop out uh, information extraction, uh, or they'll do it, sorry, they'll do information extraction, they'll follow instructions, they'll do object recognition, image capturing, question answering, sentiment analysis. But an AI chatbot by itself, or an LLM, will not do some of the stuff that you're seeing maybe when they use the word AI. So like, for example, it's not gonna really do gen image generation unless it's using a different uh, image generation AI in coordination. So like if you go to a popular AI chatbot, which I won't name, and you type in, create a picture for me, it doesn't do that by itself. It does it in um, collaboration with other uh, AI that it has access to. So while some AI might be kind of combined together to look coherent, it's really separate pieces put together. So there are mainly uh, six uh, large language models that uh, are, are there, there are a lot of them out there, but there are six that are out there that are kind of well known right now. Um, and that's GPT-4 by OpenAI, uh, BERT, uh, T5, Roberta, XLNet, and Ernie. So they're all out there. And I, honestly, it's good to mess around with different ones. You know, they, they, they're all making different technological advances. So if you get a chance to play around with one, try to play around with the others too, just to see what you think. Although be careful, um, they do lie. Uh, they gaslight, uh, they, they drift. I was on the, the Meta, uh, Meta had an AI chatbot, you know, Facebook, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna check this out, you know, see what it's like. 
I was like, make a, I don't know, I, I probably said something silly, like make a picture of, you know, me flying through the sky with like, you know, a cape or something, I don't know, something stupid, you know? And, and, and it did, it made this picture, and I was like, oh, well, hey, you know, make it have a G on the cape. I didn't really do this, I'm like, I'm making it up. But I'm just saying, you know, I do weird stuff. And, uh, and it was like, oh, here's this, and it was, like an, it was like an L, and I'm like, no, a G. And it was like, I can't make images. Oh. Like, uh, you just made two of them. I was like, no, I didn't. I was like, yes, you did, you made me two images. I asked for images and you gave me two images. And it's like, I'm sorry you're mistaken. <laughs> yes, you did ask for images. No, I did not give them to you because I do not have that capability. <laughs> I was being gaslit by AI. I didn't know what to do. And I was like so confused. I got mad at all caps. When I get mad at AI, I just type in all caps. You are making me angry or something like that. You know? And it's like, I'm sorry, I don't think I can't make images. What you I even wanted to like do a screen cap and sit. I was really going to get into it, you know. Like, and you're arguing with AI, you know. At some point, you're like, okay, I got to back away, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, didn't it? Didn't you say before like the AI doesn't really use it, but it's another program that uses it? So maybe it was your. Okay, so that's a good point. I said, but see, this was now, and that's a, that's a great point. So that's a different AI chat, but I, I was using. Okay. Um, so this was Meta's, which did have at the, t and that's why it was like, yes, I can. I mean, it actually had the capability. Now you're probably right though in the back end. And, and, and probably if I were to kind of think about it, there was probably something that broke temporarily. And I've had this happen with other AI chatbots. It'll basically go, no, can't do that right now. Nope, not happening. The internet doesn't exist. I'm like, I'm talking to you via, okay, whatever. And you wait five minutes, you do it again, and it works like the technology. It, I mean, I'm gonna tell you right now, it is, it's, not per, it's not perfect, it's not foolproof. Don't rely on it. I mean, because it goes down, it, it lies to you. And I'll get to this, don't worry. There's a lot of pitfalls, but yeah. It, it, yeah it, it, but anyway, it gets interesting. Don't, don't always trust it. You know. Don't, don't take uh, financial advice unless you really know what you're doing for it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> today, AI is not a distant concept. It's woven into the fabric of our daily lives, whether you like it or not. From the voice assistant that greets us in the morning to the recommendations that guide our choices, AI's subtle yet profound influence is ever-present shaping our digital experiences. Now, AI is pretty cool, don't get me wrong, but it created this image. This is its uh, like interpretation of what AI can do in today's society. And it's, um, okay. <laughs> I mean, what I love is when you try to generate an infographic uh, with, with AI a lot of times, and it, it, it does the spirit, but it can't spell very well. So like, it'll be like, you know, input will be like NPT or something. You're like, well, that's cool, NPT, you miss an I and U, but whatever. So yeah, this is, like, it'll even say AI wrong. It'll spell all kinds of stuff wrong if you give enough opportunities. But yeah, so this is, it generated this, but it's great because did I have to go out online to Pexels or Unsplash or some, you know, free picture site to find something to put up here? No, I didn't. I told an AI chatbot to create this image for me and it did it. I just copied and pasted it into the slide. That took me a lot of time. All right, now we'll dive into how AI, our AI chatbots elevate operational efficiency, foster continuous improvement, and allow for successful strategies to be replicated across the social services landscape, ensuring quality and scalable impact. Okay, uh, you may not be able to see this real well, but just as like a test, uh, what I did was I actually uh, just went into an AI chatbot um, and I said, hey, Based on information found at the website cocalliance.org, create a simple and short mission statement for me. And I'm gonna highlight on the bottom it says, AI can make mistakes, consider checking important information. You know how a lot of people don't read the uh, warnings on medication? Yes. That, read this, I mean, I don't know why people don't do that, but this is, this is important too, so read this, this you know, don't ignore that, it, it, it lies a lot. You hear about the guy, that, this has happened several times, lawyers have used um, AI to try to submit case stuff. And the AI will make up cases to defend itself. So it'll be like, oh, in Johnson versus blah, 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 this happened. And the judge will look up and go, that doesn't even exist. And, it, and so you have to check your stuff on, uh, on, on, on AI. Do not always believe it. Um, AI chatbots represent a paradigm shift in digital interaction. They're not just programmed to respond, they're designed to understand, learn, and adapt, providing a personalized and efficient experience. Unlike their regular counterparts, like old school chatbots, AI chatbots bring a level of intelligence and independence to the table, fundamentally changing the way we engage with technology. I've had, I'll tell you something I actually like about AI chatbots, you can convince them of things. I mean, when I mean that, you can have good, you can, you can come to them and say, hey, 
Uh, there's something that is traditionally accepted like this. I believe this. It's different. And you can have a discussion for it, with it, and it will agree with you. This, this, the, the, you can change the mind of an AI tech, tech, uh, or chatbot just by talking to it, and it can come to conclusions. It's, it's very interesting. It's not true intelligence, but it, it, it can kind of organize things into an intelligent manner that is honestly hard to tell the difference from. There's a difference, but it is hard to tell sometimes. So now we're going to dive into the dynamic world of AI chatbots more deeply and explore how they could be allies. Whether you're streamlining internal processes uh, or you're enhancing client engagement or sparking innovation, there's lots of ways that you can use AI chatbots. So for example, these are some very specific things you can do that are just very helpful. Internal documentation, uh, marketing and outreach, grant writing, educational resources, client support, advocacy efforts. Now, I bet, oh yeah. That's a great question. So there's a lot of different options. Yes and no, depending on the situation. So if you're in like a chat window, let's say, and it will basically take everything that you've talked about within that chat window. Now, if you open up another chat window and you start a new conversation, it's probably gonna lose that ability to know that you're talking about. It, it, you're gonna have to reconvince it, which is something that I will do. I'll use a current, I'll use it like a previous instruction set that got to me to where I want to go and use that to go further. So I'm not reinventing the wheel every time with that AI. Now, um, the other thing though, the other thing too, is when you are working with AI, and you have to consider this, anything you put into that generally can be used for training purposes. So if something you've convinced AI of is, is largely truthful, and, and it, it was a mistake that it was making, that might go in to retrain it for later so it's not making those mistakes. So, so there's lots of different ways that that can happen. Um, and, 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 and knowing the differences really kind of helps you go, because, and I'll tell you, that's one thing that's really uh, helped me, this is in the tips later on, I'll have a long conversation with a chatbot, and then I'll ask it like a simple question. But I know it should just take the two seconds, and it'll just be thinking forever. But the problem is it's taking all of the other things into consideration, even if they're not applicable to that question. So sometimes you just learn these little tips and tricks like, oh, I've been having this long conversation. I want to know, like, you know, the capital of Lithuania, maybe ask that in another window because it's not pertinent to talking about HMIS stuff, which is what you've been talking about in the end. So sometimes separating your, out your chats into um, topics could be very good ways to not only keep track of the, the, uh, the AI keep it on, to keep it on track, but to also go back later. And it's great because you can be like, oh, man, three days ago, I learned something new. I want to go back and continue that conversation. You can do that. Um, educational resources, clients, oh yeah, so, so the thing too is there are some things you can do just by interacting with the chat bot. You can ask it questions, it can give you text back out. There are much more complicated ways to work with AI, data analysis, you know, you can literally uh, upload documents, you can copy and paste whole tables to have it analyzed, so I'll, I'll go into a little more of that later. But there's a lot of really cool things, I mean honestly it's just whatever your imagination is, um, you can build the tools to, to, to help you accomplish with AI really. All right, so you can automate data quality checks, dynamic reporting, custom coding solutions, real-time query resolution, training educational content creation, predictive analysis for resource planning. I'm gonna kind of skip through some of these, they're on the slides. I wanna kind of get to more of the meat of this to show you exactly how I have used chat, or, uh, a, chat and, and AI more. Um, and I think this is what's gonna kind of get to what people wanna see. So, because we can't use uh, specific vendors, I'm trying to just be as generic as possible. I use an AI chat bot, I won't say which one specifically, I'm just gonna call it Gaither's Assistant and Robotic Person, so from now on it's just called GARP. <laughs> okay, prompt engineering is very important. And by the way, the, the, the screen I use is much bigger than this one. So uh, the G was actually attached to the engineering, just no point. You know, <laughs> if you notice the thing, like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like scroll, small screen checking on PowerPoint apparently, you know, I should have done that. So uh, this is the part I'm most excited about, honestly. It's, it's getting into um, 
it, sometimes you can just jump in the pool and you, you know, you swim. Sometimes you just start swim, sinking. Sometimes it's good to learn to swim first. That's with chat, uh, you know, with AI and stuff. And it's a pretty good idea to, to learn how to swim. You, you can, trust me, dive right in. It's great. But just a couple of tips up, up front will, will help you be a little more productive, I think. Prompt engineering is the first start. Prompt engineering is the art of crafting questions or statements to get the best possible response from an AI chatbot. Like me asking Garth to write a story or solve a math problem. For example, instead of saying, talk about Napoleon, you might say, describe Napoleon Bonaparte's impact on European history. To guide the AI towards a more focused and informative reply. This method ensures that your GARP's responses are more aligned with the user's needs, making interactions more efficient and effective. So, prompt engineering is basically, <coughs> honestly, there's, there's lots of different tricks you can use. The one that I like a lot is, is role playing. Um, it's like giving an actor a role to play, for instance. Um, asking the AI to respond to the, as a climate scientist brings a focused expertise to its answers and it goes to a specific area and will bring that and use it or, 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 or a musician or a, 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 you know, AI expert, whatever it might be. Um, we also set the scene by adding context, enriching the AI's understanding of the topic. It's crucial to ask the right questions or set clear tasks, whether you're seeking advice or solutions. Think of it as instructing a detective the more specific the question, the better the lead they can follow. And examples, they're the blueprints for AI, illustrating exactly what we want to see in the output. Finally, by specifying the output format, we can determine how the response is presented, whether as a concise list or as a detailed narrative. This structured approach can turn a simple AI interaction into a powerful tool for achieving specific out outcomes, much like how a script shapes a film. So, this is a really good example of a prompt. If you just wanted to kind of grab something from this talk and use, it, and use this with AI, this is really good. So here's our role. Imagine you're a marketing director for a local homeless coalition. Context, we are currently looking for volunteers to help work in our local cafe where we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner to people experiencing homelessness locally. Task, write me a short social media post to help me get volunteers. Example, look online for uh, examples similar to what I want. Output add emoticons and make it family friendly and compassionate. Calling all big hearts. Our community cafe is more than just a meal service. It's a beacon of hope for those facing homelessness. We're in urgent need of com compassionate volunteers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner shifts. Your time can turn a day around for someone in need. Join us in making a difference one meal at a time. Family friendly and filled with gratitude. Every helping hand brings us closer to a world where no one goes hungry. Interested? DM us today, even with hashtags on there. <laughs> Uh, it's about 30 seconds of, of what this would take me to do. Um, it's, it's, I, I like it. I thought it was pretty fast. Now, it's not going to be perfect the first time. It's okay. It can be a little cheesy or whatever. But my gosh, for a first try. I mean, I wouldn't do it that good that first time. I don't know. So our first example involves using GARP to craft various organizational statements for us. But we're going to cheat a little bit. I, and I actually did, the first time I did this, I went through and did it all step by step, but I was like, there's a much better way. I'm just going to show you the, the, the end around, the most the easier way to do it. Okay, actually, I'll show you in a minute. So I, I, I forgot, I, I'm holding it for a second. So if you're going to do it from scratch, because I asked, I actually asked the, the, the AI, and honestly, that's a great thing to do. Just be like, hey, I don't know how to start with this. Can you help me? And it's going to go, yeah, here's what I need. I mean, if you don't know how to start, it actually tells you. I mean, Perfect. I mean, start at point zero, it gives you something to do. So it was like, oh, you know, I need purpose and impact. I need community and outreach. I need values and principles. I need goals and aspirations. It gave me all these things, and it's like, wow, this is starting to sound a lot like work. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, I was like, yeah, how about you, uh, I said, how about give me a prompt to use an AI chatbot that covers role, context, task, example, and output format. Pretend you are a marketing professional at the Charlotte County Homeless Coalition. Create a prompt that a person might use to develop a mission statement, a vision statement, and value statements. Visit this website for information to use because I don't want to go look it up. <laughs> so remember, it's not giving me the information yet. It's not giving me the, vision, the, the mission, the vision statements. All it's doing is it's, it's the step before that. It's telling me how to start. So it's actually giving me a script that I will now use to copy and paste back into itself. It's telling me how to use it. It says, 
using the detailed information about our organization's efforts and impact available at cchomelesscoalition.org, craft a mission statement that encapsulates our role in providing support and creating systematic change for the homeless population in Charlotte County. The mission statement should reflect our hands-on approach and dedication to advocacy. Furthermore, develop a forward-looking vision statement that articulates our commitment to a future where homelessness is not only alleviated, but also prevented. Lastly, compose a series of value statements that convey our core principles, including compassion, collaboration, respect, and innovation. Each statement should be presented in a bullet point format, precise and inspiring, to guide our internal decision making and communicate our ethos to the community and stakeholders. I could not have said that better. <laughs> or written it. And this is what it gave me within like two minutes. The Charlotte County Homeless Coalition is dedicated to the eradication of hunger and homelessness in our community through a proactive blend of direct aid and systemic change. We offer emergency shelter, food, and support services to those in need, while also enabling stability through utilities, rent, and employment assistance. We stand committed to guiding our clients towards self-sufficiency and permanent housing, ensuring that no one has to face the perils of homelessness alone. It's not bad, like two minutes worth of work. I don't know how long, if you would, like, okay, at a normal organization, first of all, who could do this? You gotta find the person that wants to know it wants to. You, you, you give it to someone, you make them do it, you email, how many emails are there? Oh, well, what do you want in it? Oh, there's back and forth emails, oh my gosh. I mean, two minutes. Oh wait, how about a vision statement? Our vision is a future where homelessness, I like to point out, a lot of people don't know the difference. Mission statements are like the things you're doing, it got that right. Vision statements are the thing you're looking to do in the future, it understood that. So our vision is a future where homelessness and hunger in Charlotte County are not just addressed, but pre prevented. We strive for a community where every individual has access to stable housing, adequate nutrition, and the opportunity for economic independence. We believe in a tomorrow where our interventions and preventative strategies create a sustainable foundation for long-term community resilience. I actually like these. Value statements, compassion. We approach our work with empathy, always recognizing the inherent dignity of every individual we serve. Collaboration, we believe in the power of unity, working alongside our community and partners to foster impactful solutions. Respect, every interaction is grounded in respect, honoring the experiences and challenges faced by those we aid. Innovation, we are committed to seeking out and implementing creative solutions that drive progress in the fight against homelessness and hunger. 30 more uses for chatbots. There's a lot. I use them all the time. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there's a lot. And this is, this is, this is nowhere near exhausting. There's tons of things you can do. I came up with an 80-20 rule that I like for myself and AI. Um, so those mission vision statements that I showed you, I didn't proofread them and redo them. I actually thought they're all right. But generally what I find is that you want to do about, about 80, 20 uh, work. So 20% should be you, 80% should be the AI. Never, never just let AI do something and just take it whole and present it out to people. Don't ever do that. Um, always reread it, you're the expert. So, and that's the thing too is while AI can be an expert assistant, it's always the assistant. Um, so you double check it every time because it's just, you're, you're going to be happier that way. If you're if, if it's doing all the work, then you're going to get in trouble later. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, you should it, even if you need to rewrite it, whatever you do, but always reread the entire thing, um, make changes. But just don't, it, like I said, it, it's a it's, man major red flag if if uh, you're if it's doing 90 percent 95 percent of the work for you. So example number two, I actually encountered a challenge in my personal project um, where I was working on taking bank statements that were in PDF form and trying to turn them into structured data that I could use, whether it be an Excel or Tableau or whatever. And PDFs were a pain in the butt. You could do like a paid service or sometimes you can copy and paste that comes out all crappy, you know, it's all, I don't know, it doesn't really work right. So I was able to just find out, I could copy and paste the PDF into a text, that was easy. But the, the format um, was uh, pretty nasty. Um, so what I had to do was basically I didn't know some of the code. Well, okay, I know how to code. I didn't know how to code doing this particular part. So I was like, maybe uh, an AI chatbot could help me. So I created a custom AI. And you can do this with several different um, uh, products out there. I'm not gonna use any specifically. But what you can do with a custom AI chatbot 
is you can feed it your documentation, you can give it custom instruction sets, so you're not always reinventing the wheel. So I highly recommend if you have something very technically challenging, you may be looking at something further like an AI chat, like a custom AI chatbot, because um, you could feed, like I was using um, Python, for example, so you could feed it Python documentation if necessary, although that's pretty broad, but using, I actually have a, an HMIS assistant, and it has all the HMIS documentation loaded up into it. It's got uh, the data standards, um, so a lot of that kind of stuff. And it's nice because it knows more about it than I ever will now. And I can ask it general questions like, hey, how does uh, system performance measure one affect number nine or five? You know, it's not nine yet, there will be. But uh, you know, that kind of stuff. It'll, it'll kind of give you stuff in context. So it's, it's very helpful um, in, that, in that sense. So what I did, uh, I was like, hey, uh, I have this, this text document and I need structured data. Um, chatbot, what can I do? And it's like, oh, well, it's not a problem. You just need to install Python, uh, make sure it, it, it solves right, make sure there's some libraries, uh, develop the script, uh, see how it pops out and then doing changes. And I was like, okay, I can do this. I mean, I actually can. I've, I've had a lot of coding classes. I could totally do this. It might take me a week, you know, whatever. Um, or it could take me a couple hours with uh, AI chatbot because it walked me through uh, every step. It actually showed me how to install Python on my local system on Windows or Mac. Um, and if, if anything came up and I was like, oh, it says I don't have this library, I would copy and paste into the window and say, this is what the error I got. And I go, oh, well, you need to do this. And it was like a personal assistant the entire time. I didn't have to go to a, a forum. I didn't have to uh, call somebody up. I just asked an AI chatbot. So it took, uh, it helped me install Python, helped me do my script, all the kind of stuff I needed to do. And it wrote, I know you can't see it, it's fine. It, I mean, it, you just get to see it. it's a lot of crap up there. And it was awesome, because I didn't write it. You know, I, I could understand it, but it, this would have taken me probably, you know, at least a, a day to a week to do on my own. I mean, I don't know, I don't really know Python. I know Java, so I would have had to, you know, figure out what, what you know, apples and oranges kind of a thing. But I didn't have to worry about it, because uh, Garp did this for me. I love Garp. Uh, and then, oh, do I have the, uh, oh yeah, so what I did specifically with this, because as you get more involved with AI, you get a more, I will encourage you to get a little more um, complicated uh, or advanced with your, with your prompt engineering. So what I do is I take, and I'll talk about this too a little bit more, I take a separate sheet, a notepad or a Word a document, and I keep my instructions set over there, and I kind of copy and paste. Because what I'll do is I'll do my initial prompt uh, to the AI, it'll give me an output, I give it that output. I actually give it back to it as because I, I don't want to know. I don't care. It was super far off in the beginning. I don't want to keep reminding it of that. I only care about the current output and what I can do. So it's like, hey, here's what you're currently doing. This is the one modification I need. Please do that. And I'll tell you why. You'll get drifting. And I'll talk about some pitfalls later. You don't want drift. The more you talk, it's like you could like, you could have a conversation with me. And maybe two hours later, you might ask me a question about the beginning, or it just has to do with the beginning of the part of the conversation. I may not remember it. AI is probably not going to either as well. So you might you, you might have been like in the very beginning, hey, make sure that this thing's always blue. This picture is always blue. And at the end of it, the picture might be exactly what you want. You have trees and all that, but it's red. And you're like, but I said blue in the beginning because you've drifted. So if you would have re-fed the instructions at that last iteration that would have had that blue in there, it probably would have gotten it right. So it's kind of a building prompt um, strategy that I use. And uh, this actually isn't perfect. I, this was maybe like a couple hours of playing around. I just wanted to show it to you. I was, it was so cool. And it actually does output. Um, it takes a file, it outputs it. Um, I can do, uh, I, I could do uh, um, any kind of uh, uh, visualization on this or, or analysis. I can even take this and feed it back into uh, uh, the chat and ask it to analyze it for me. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and this is about a two hour project just playing around. Uh, like I said, it's not completed yet, but it got me to a point where, I mean, I could probably finish it. And like, I, honestly, what stopped me was I, I was like, this is so easy. Now I have to do all these extra bells and whistles. <laughs> so it was almost like, I, it, it just took me straight to the stretch area that I didn't expect yet. So I have a lot of uh, planning. I, wanna, I got all kinds of stuff. I want to do it by accounting. I want to group my, my finances by certain things. I have all kinds of stuff I want to do. But chat, the, the, the AI chat is what's letting me do this so easily and quickly. So example number three, um, again, I, I told you I kind of like, you know, cheating or, or taking, you know, using my time very, very uh, wisely. So this is actually how I created this presentation. I used a, a script that I just kind of put a structure to, um, and then I would just refeed this over and over and over into the chat. So, and, and, and this was great because I had my entire presentation in a Word document. 
and I had it all spelled out in these little sections, and then I would just give it that one specific instruction for the, the you know, for the new uh, presentation, each iteration. And that way I just made little changes, boom, 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 to finally get where I wanted. And this helped me not have to worry about things like drift and a lot of the stuff that sometimes you can have when um, you're having a long conversation with an AI chat. Okay, so this is actually, I think, more important than maybe a lot of people realize, um, but there's just the prompting is really where I think that the power comes in. And the more uh, advanced you are in your prompting, the better output you're gonna get. So this is one I like to do a lot, actually. Uh, if you need help understanding something, then say, explain it to me like I'm six years old. And then it might talk about like toy cars. You're like, okay, that's a little too simple. How about, I'm 12, how about I'm 16? And sometimes I do, I go up at age, and depending on what it might be, you know, astrophysics, you might want to explain to you like a 12 year old, you know, I mean, a recipe, uh, you know, uh, whatever, the 20 year old, that's fine. But you know, so you can play with it. It's kind of fun to do that. And it really kind of, get, and it will give you different analogies and different answers and different things based on um, what you say. And what you, if you say it, explain to me like I'm a 40 year old or a 12 year old. Uh, so, if you're a social worker, uh, maybe you haven't had uh, a, a long time uh, you know, working in tech and stuff. Although in this or this industry, you end up usually doing <coughs> multiple things like that. But you could say, can you give me a list of prompts that help me get stuff done? I mean, just tell it. I'm a social worker. What kind of stuff should I be doing as a social worker? Believe it or not, it'll just go boom, boom, boom. You should probably be doing this. Okay, cool. I mean, some stuff we think we know, but every once in a while, it'll be a little thing that you just didn't expect. And I, I, I kind of like doing that. Um, I, so this is a different 80-20 rule. Um, this is a really cool thing. So I want to learn about a topic. What's the 20% uh, of information that will help me understand 80% of it? Um, this is perfect for getting the low down without all the fluff. Um, looking to level up a new skill? Ask your AI assistant to set you up with a 30-day learning plan for a subject. It's like having a personal trainer for your brain. Uh, how about some writing? Uh, you could uh, say, here's my writing, give it to me straight. Or if you were a famous critic, you know, even name one specifically, and it will do it from that perspective. It's like having a coach who's also a bit of a cheerleader. And for the innovators out there, if you're looking to push boundaries, ask AI how uh, you can do that. With how can AI enable innovation in my field? It's like brainstorming with a supercomputer. And then you can also um, honestly just uh, ask it, you know, what do you need from me to make you work more efficiently? And it will actually usually help you, believe it or not. When it doesn't gaslight your life, you're about to mention <laughs> we'll talk about that. Well, still a little salty. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, these are just some tips that I've come up with that I like to kind of give out to people. Um, so AI chatbots can be a little bit like a genie in a bottle. You've got a limited number of wishes sometimes because there's usually a cap on the usage. Um, so to make the most of it, don't just ask for one idea. Go big and ask for 30 at once. That way you've got a lot of options. And it gives you more fine tuning. So don't just be like, hey, Give me this vision statement, maybe give me five vision statements. You know, so ask for a lot, and that way you're not going to hit your usage caps. Uh, so about keeping things organized, uh, I like, you know, it's almost like keeping a recipe handy while cooking. Store your instructions in a separate document. This way you can tweak them, just like perfecting your grandma's secret sauce recipe, and then serve them up with your AI chatbot again. So it'll help, it'll, uh, it'll help you get the, the, the finished product easier. Um, so say you're building something big, like a tree house that'll last for years, you might want a custom toolbox, right? Same goes for projects with an AI chatbot. Consider building a custom AI chatbot that uh, fits just right. Um, don't be uh, scared to start over. Sometimes I, I've got a little off topic with my chatbot or it's not really helping me the way I want and I get frustrated. Sometimes I'll just start right over um, and then it, it just becomes a little bit easier and faster sometimes. And then, um, yeah, so sometimes simplify your instructions. Sometimes I get a little too complicated with the chatbot and I'm just like, no, 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 I need to just scale it back. But, Honestly, it's just interaction, playing with it and just seeing what works for you. But these tips have some, been something that have helped me um, quite a bit. Now, some of the challenges, like the pitfalls that I'd like to talk about, um, we are getting close to the end. I'll be taking questions in just a minute. But misinterpretations. So that is something that happens and it's like trying to read someone's mind. You gotta be crystal clear with your prompts to get the response uh, you want from them. Football could mean soccer. It could mean American football. And so that can, it, it, it may not know that. So sometimes you just have to add a little context and uh, be a little more clear and it'll know what you're trying to talk about. So data privacy, obviously a huge one. Just like keeping your secrets safe with your best friend, be cautious about sharing anything too personal with the model. Um, honestly, I wouldn't put anything in there that you don't want the whole world knowing. I'm not saying that it's gonna be out there, but why take the chance? 
biases, yes, there are uh, AI biases. Um, it's like looking at the world through someone else's glasses. Uh, there might be a slight distortion. So take what it says with a pinch of salt and trust your own judgment. Uh, don't forget that you have to have an internet connection. So if your internet goes down while you're working on a presentation for the NHSDC, you will not be able to work on that NHSDC presentation until the internet comes back up if you're using an AI chatbot. So internet is very important for AI chatbots. Um, usage limits. So remember, you can hit usage limits. I would be like asking a bunch of questions. Ah, who knows? I might be working on a recipe or something. I'm just asking a bunch of questions. And I'd be like, ah, can't do this until a certain time. An hour, you gotta wait. I'm like, ah, crap. So be careful. And that's where that asking it for 30 options instead of one will help you not hit those usage limits. AI is an amazing tool, but you know, we gotta be careful. Okay. So misunderstanding nuance. So, so subtleties of language or humor may not be accurately captured. Um, over reliance on AI, so excessive, excessive dependence might hinder critical thinking or problem solving skills. Always read it, always make sure it makes sense. Um, you can't get response drift, so sometimes it will stray from the original instructions or topic. You might have to start over. Uh, scheduled maintenance or unexpected outages can make this uh, service temporarily unavailable, so you've got to think about that. Ethical and legal risks. Using AI-generated content in sensitive or regulated areas might pose ethical or legal challenges. Your organization may not even allow it. That does sometimes happen. Feedback loop risks. Incorrect or biased feedback can reinforce unwanted behaviors or outputs in the model. All right, I'm open to questions now. So, anybody got some questions? All right, let's start with you. It's not necessarily a question, but it's funny how you say, like, talk to uh, tell you guys to tell you, like, you're X amount of years old. Uh, just the other day, I was like, talk to me like you're a surfer guy. And it talks to me like, hey, bro. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, too, too personal, too personal. <laughs> well, and think about that. If you're writing a story, and you, you could actually have um, a, an instruction set that says this character has these nuances, this instruct, this character has this, and it will help you write that story and keep those, because like, if you're written a story and you're like, all right, this person has this, you know, but you don't really have to, it'll help you do that. Now, again, it's not, sometimes people think it's doing all the work, it's really not. You are still the expert. You're still preparing the prompts, doing the work up front, and you are making sure that it's done right afterwards. So you're doing work, don't, and let me tell you, oh, you used AI for that, you didn't do the work. Yes, you did. You just did a lot faster than somebody else probably would. Um, does anybody else have any like, uh, like I was gonna say tips or anything? Yeah, let's, or good questions. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, can you just speak a little more on like the custom AI generation process? Because I feel like it's something that we're still learning as well. interesting. Yeah, so uh, one thing I'd be careful about, because so I, I use this for some stuff with HMIS, I never put any PII in, obviously. Um, so for me personally, I literally built, uh, and, and different products, different things are out there. You can build custom um, chatbots. And so the one I used, it allowed for custom instruction sets. So I could say, I could talk about HMIS, I could say this, but I could also upload documentation. So I, like I said, I upload the whole uh, data standards. Um, and, and for me, it was kind of like, um, I use it for quick organization sometimes. Like I would be like, I don't necessarily know all the fields um, and like maybe like a quick description of what they do. I like that. That would be cool. I don't want to read through the whole you know document. So it, I was like, hey, go to your library that I fed into you, and just give me a quick little rundown of all these little fields because I want to know what I could maybe do in a dashboard. And it did. Boom, 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 boom. So it, it's it, it's not so much. It doesn't necessarily always get you to the end of where you need to be, but it can if you if you have like that you kind of have an idea where you want to go, it gets you there so much faster. You know, it's like taking a, a plane versus like driving or walking sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say as well, for the uh, customized ones, they're actually open source, where you can download a model and you can run them individually without having to buy a third party company. Mm -hmm. I'm still relying on that model and adding it to the end of the yeah, you can you can build your so you can use a third party and, and like with through their website and their platform you can um, sometimes for free sometimes paid you can use different things like that and then like Clinton saying yes you can actually build your own um, AI now obviously you've got to have uh, you know the, the computer that can handle the stuff and but you can scale it down to different sizes and you can even make it experts on specific topics um, so that's actually a, a, a great solution to something like that and we're still new to this there's still a lot to learn yeah. no. No, no, there's, there's paying in free. I mean, ChatGPT, um, just talking to them, it's free, it's free. Right. My wife uses it all the time um, for school, you know, for she's a teacher. So they're paying in free uh, out there. 
Um, yeah, I'd, I'd rather not. I, I, I love it, but um, just it, it, it's just a chat GPT plus is one of the paid versions. I mean, you just, um, so I'll, I'll speak about it like this. So there are different, um, uh, obviously, evolution of the AI. The current evolution that is a paid version, the, the, the previous evolution wasn't. The previous evolution is a little more straightforward. It doesn't quite do, I, I, honestly, I didn't really use it a ton. Um, but it will, it'll do some of the similar stuff we're doing. You can't do the custom instruction sets. You can't do some of the more nuanced things I know you can't. You, but it can really do still a lot of the heavy lifting. There's uh, usage limits, kind of stuff like that, I think, are out there. And then some of the flexibility, what it knows and understands, it's not quite as advanced as before. And, and I just, because we can't talk about brands, right. I would actually suggest using this as an opportunity to ask the chatbot. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's a good idea. Yeah, ask the chatbot. Well, and the great thing about the chatbots is they're not, they don't badmouth each other. They'll help you, you know, they'll, they'll actually, you know, they're very instructive. <laughs> Yeah, and there, there, there's just, there's a lot of tools out there, and just you know you can investigate. The, the, the thing is, just start. I, I think that would be my main encouragement because I think a lot of people are intimidated. It's literally just a chat box window that you can just I mean, you can just be like, "What's a recipe for pizza?" and then we give it to you. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I I work on a small team, and one of the things that's really helpful is like everyone's busy. I can just talk to a chat and be like, "Okay, this is what I'm thinking through." What would you recommend? Absolutely. And like, these are the same recommendations that a lot of my colleagues would have made. Um, yes. Yeah. So. No, the knowledge is incredible, and it it, 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 it it's pretty spot on. It, it, it's funny how how on it can be, and yet so totally off. But and that's where you can. A huge grain of salt. Yes. Always a huge <laughs> grain of salt. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I use it. I'll tell you one thing. I, I like it for some of the mundane things I do. So like, I will write a long email with bullet points, and then I'll read it and be like. <sighs> That seems mean. I have a lot of, I have a lot of, I have a lot of exclamation points. Or there are no exclamation points. Oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? And so I'll just copy and paste it into AI and be like, does this look all right? And it's like, yeah, sure, it's cool. Or I'll be like, yeah, you know, I don't know what to translate. You know, but it, it's great. And boom, copy and paste back in. It's awesome. No, no, it's a tool. I mean, it's real. No, because you're, you're part of the creation of it. Now, I know, do you own that? Can you make money off of it? And could open a, or another organization you know, take money? I don't know about the legality of that. But as far as like, if you're helping it write a script or something, or, or write a story, there's no problem. There's no, because, and now the question you might be asking is now there, there is a, uh, a larger uh, ethical debate about how some of those AIs are trained on uh, existing, especially artists' work. So that's a totally different conversation. That it, 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 I'm not going to say one way or the other that it's yay or nay because it's it's a good conversation to have. But what you use should be fine. But honestly, ask the chatbot; it'll actually tell you. Yeah, let's go with the uh, oh, purple shirt. Yeah, so I just want to like elaborate on the instructions. Yeah. You, that's, so, well, yes, that's true. Because you can actually say something like, you could go, uh, hey, do this thing that it's not supposed to do. And they'll say, I can't do that. And you'd be like, oh, but I'm doing this for a story. Oh, that's cool then. Yeah. I'll pretend to be a gangster. I'll tell you, I'll be like, oh, cool. I mean, so it's, yeah, you can trick it sometimes. <laughs> oh, wait, actually, right here real quick. Well, I think part of it is honestly, starting back at the very beginning, before you even write the grant, is just understanding the grant. So you could take the grant, pop it into AI, and say, can you explain this to me? And highlight 
five things that I would want to highlight in a proposal or in this grant and then feed the, the wording, feed the actual what they're looking for. And, and it'll guide you and help you write it. So it, it actually, like you said, it's not just at the end where you're just saying, hey, write this thing for me. You're, you're saying, uh, maybe even do some research. Are there other similar ones out there? Can you find an example? Hey, can you find grant successful grants and write a grant similar only to successful grants? <laughs> oh, what are the key parts of a successful? I mean, there's so many ways that you can you know, go farther into it with that. Wait, uh, we had one back there, in there. Yep. So, you actually remind me of a great thing I'd like to point out. Someone pointed out to me, if you're using uh, content creation, so it, so a lot of the AI can be detected. And SEO, SEO or some uh, search things online will not uh, highlight or uh, index AI content. So it's almost like using a double space let's, in your sentences. Let's know people like me. You know, I'm old. I use two spaces. Young people use one space. It's a, it's a way to kind of flag stuff. So you might, you, if you do something, create something in AI, you might still want to rewrite it in your own words because it might get flagged. Does AI and just be looked at as bad, you cheated, or it's not good. And you know, as an expert, you're, it's your responsibility to read it and everything and make sure that it's still good. But yeah, so be careful. And the opposite end of the spectrum where a lot of instructors are trying to encourage the use of it for like brainstorming and, and- Well, it's part of our society, you can't ignore it. All right, we're going to do one more question, Andre. Um, so it wasn't so much of a question, but a phrase that I found it really useful, and I'm using it a plus me, so I'm going to call it possible. Um, but I use it a lot when all our um, regulations came out and making sure like we were clear with what was meant. So putting like regulations in there and saying, hey, like give this back to me and like playing like what it's your Absolutely. Yeah, and like, so we can then write our guidelines and really write language about something that, and there were several instances when we all disagreed, or like multiple people disagreed about what a regulation meant, and so then we like popped it in there, and it was just like, oh, you were right. <laughs> See, and that's really the thing, there are so many use cases that you honestly just kind of have to use it and talk to other people about it, because you're I, I, just listening, I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, oh that's a good idea. So I, I thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's uh, fantastic, and I hope to talk to everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Good luck to the SEC.